In this video we'll look at the Heathkit HR1680 amateur radio receiver. I'll cover the history of the radio, its features and key design aspects, and go over the front and rear panel controls and connectors. We'll also take a look inside. I'll talk about the restoration of this particular unit and then give an on-air demonstration of the radio in use. Heathkit was a company that sold electronic devices in kit form from the late 1940s through the early 1990s. They were particularly known for their extensive and popular line of amateur radio equipment. Heathkit sold several series of amateur radio equipment at various price and feature points. They ranged from a very low cost regenerative receiver to mid-range units like the radio in this video to the very popular HW and SB series. The HR1680 was a mid-range amateur radio receiver offered from 1977 to 1982 and like most Heath kits was sold as a kit that was built by the owner. The price ranged from US $319.95 to $219.95 over the years it was offered. A replacement for the two-based HR10B, it was all solid state and roughly styled like the more expensive HW and SB series. A matching transmitter, the HX1681, came out in 1979, and the matching speaker offered by Heathkit was the HS1661. The unit receives amateur radio bands only and is not a general coverage shortwave radio. It's designed to receive CW, Morse code, and single sideband voice signals, but not AM. It receives the first 500 kilohertz of the 80, 40, 20, and 15 meter bands, and the first megahertz of the 10 meter band. This covers the entire range of these ham bands except for the upper portion of 10 meters, but does not include some newer bands that were introduced since the early 1980s. It's an all solid state dual conversion superhead design and features an analog frequency dial, S meter, built in power supply, 100 kHz crystal calibrator, and audio filter for CW reception. Most circuitry is on four printed circuit boards, and it can be aligned without any test instruments and uses a pre assembled wiring harness. Sensitivity is rated at 0.5 microvolts and selectivity at 2.1 kHz. In the narrow position, the audio bandwidth is 250 Hz, centered at about 750 Hz. Let's take a look at the front panel controls. AF gain has the power switch and controls audio gain or volume. RF gain controls the receiver sensitivity and is normally fully clockwise unless an extremely strong signal is being received. The band switch selects between 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meter ham bands. To get full coverage, the 10 meter band is split between two settings, 10A and 10B. The pre-selector control tunes the RF amplifier stage. It's adjusted for maximum signal whenever the band is changed or when tuning across the band. The quarter inch phone jack is for headphones and cuts off the speaker when headphones are plugged in. Mode selects lower sideband, upper sideband, and CW or Morse code reception. It also sets the AGC or automatic gain control to a slow time constant when in the sideband positions and fast for CW. The function switch selects between wide bandwidth, normally for single sideband phone reception, narrow bandwidth, normally for CW reception, or CAL, which turns on the crystal calibrator. At the top left is the S meter that indicates relative signal strength calibrated in standard S units and decibels over S9. Tuning uses the large knob and frequency is read from the dial. To get the full frequency you take the basic frequency of the band and add the kilohertz value from the dial. For example the radio is currently on the 40 meter band which starts at 7 megahertz and the dial reads 110 so the frequency is 7.110 megahertz. Note that the 80 meter band starts at 3.5 MHz and the 10 meter band is broken down into ranges 10A and 10B which start at 28 and 28.5 MHz respectively. 
Also note that on some bands, the radio can tune beyond the upper limit of the amateur radio band. The dial is quite accurate, but can be calibrated to the nearest 100 kilohertz by turning on the crystal calibrator. To adjust it, you tune to a multiple of 100 kilohertz, then hold down the zero set button. Then tune for a zero beat when the calibrator is turned on. The finger hole in the tuning dial is a nice touch and allows for quickly turning the dial. Some other models, like my SB310, lacked this feature. The styling is similar to the Heathkit HW and SB series radios. The red backlight color was used in several of the later Heathkit radio models. On the rear is the AC line cord, as well as a jack for powering the unit from 13.8 volts DC. Phono jacks on the back provide, from left to right, the speaker connection, a side tone input which accepts an audio tone from a transmitter and routes it to the receiver's audio when it's muted. The matching HX1681 transmitter provided a suitable side tone signal. A spare jack which is normally unconnected, a muting connection which can be controlled by a transmitter or transmit receive relay to mute the receiver while transmitting, and the external antenna connection. The radio is built on a heavy aluminum chassis with upper and lower portions which can be removed. Most circuitry is on four printed circuit boards which can be removed by loosening a couple of screws. Connections are made to the chassis using connectors. At the left rear is the power supply circuitry with power transformer, rectifiers and filter caps. It's fused and can be wired for either 120 or 240 volts AC. The unit can also run on 13.8 volt DC power. At the front is point-to-point -point wiring for the controls including tuning capacitor and related vernier gear mechanism. The dial lamps are also here. At left front is the VFO printed circuit board. Some circuitry is shielded in a metal can. The right side has three similarly sized circuit boards. Board A in the front is the front end circuit board. Board C in the middle is the high frequency oscillator and crystal calibrator board and board D at the back is the audio and regulator board. The circuit boards are single-sided, silk-screened, and solder-masked and are made of a phenolic material rather than the more modern FR4 fiberglass. The boards are separated by metal shields. Alignment requires making adjustments to components on the boards that are not accessible when they're installed. To solve this, a set of extenders was provided that allowed a board to be extended up out of the chassis. Over the years, the extenders will typically have been discarded and lost, but there are solutions for this. A seller on eBay sells extender boards for a number of Heathkit radios, including the HR1680. They also work with the matching HX1681 transmitter. These appear to be well made, but are a little expensive at about $50 plus shipping. You can also make your own using the appropriate connectors and heavy wire. I found some instructions on the internet which provided mouser and digikey part numbers for suitable amphenol connectors. I made mine using 14 gauge AC power cable and connectors. A total of 18 wires are needed. They're a little tedious to connect, but work fine. The routing of the two wires from PCBA to the preselector capacitor is critical in order for the radio to operate correctly. There also seems to be two versions of the assembly manual. One version has only a single pre-selector wire, and the other, I think the later version, has two. It's important to route the wires as shown in the assembly manual. I bought this radio on eBay in December 2015 from a Canadian seller. It was apparently working and in quite good condition. It came with a reproduction of the manual, which is of good quality with full-size pullouts. It did not come with the matching speaker. I'm using here a low-cost Radio Shack external speaker. The official speaker was an optional extra, and many owners likely used their own speaker rather than the relatively expensive $30 to $35 official Heathkit speaker. 
it did come with an RCA Phono to UHF connector adapter. The unit was clean inside except for a bit of dust. The front panel bezel is in extremely good condition with absolutely no scratches. I noticed that two trimmer caps on the front end circuit board were missing or broken. I found part of one inside the case. These were fragile and tended to come apart. I replaced these two with new trimmer caps of similar value. Testing the unit and running through the alignment procedure, I found that the two 10 meter bands were not working. I was unable to peak the two 10 meter HFO coils because the HFO was not oscillating. My conclusion, after pretty much eliminating every other possibility, is that the two 10 meter band crystals are bad. I found an order replacement for one of them and we'll see if that fixes the problem. I went through the alignment procedure on the other bands and all went well. It's quite impressive that the alignment can be done with no instruments. It uses the built-in signals such as the crystal calibrator and at some steps the S meter is used for adjusting signals for a peak. One possible gotcha in the alignment one of the methods to adjust the crystal calibrator is to tune to the time station CHU at 7.335 MHz. Unfortunately, this station changed frequency to 7.85 MHz in 2008, which is outside the tuning range of the radio. Several other methods of adjusting the calibrator are listed in the manual. Let's power up the radio and see what we can pick up. It's afternoon here in Ottawa, Canada. We should be able to pick up a few signals on the 40 meter band, for example. So here's an example of a single sideband signal. We have it in the lower sideband mode and adjust the tuning for a proper audio pitch. Now let's see if we can pick up some CW or Morse code signals. So we'll set the mode to CW. So here we have a number of signals close together. We can probably separate those out a little better by switching to the narrow filter mode. A couple of other things to demonstrate. Typically as you're dialing through the band you need to touch up the adjustment of the pre-selector control as you move across the band. And just adjust it for a peak. Now I'll demonstrate the use of the crystal calibrator. To use that we turn the cal mode on, then adjust the dial to the nearest 100 kilohertz multiple to the frequency that we're around. Now holding down the zero set button we can tune to the dial for a zero beat.
Note that with the zero set press, the dial doesn't move. And then releasing it, we should now have the dial set exactly on the correct 100 kilohertz multiple. As I mentioned, the unit can't really receive AM signals. Typically on the 40 meter band, for example, in the evening, there tends to be some shortwave broadcast stations near the top end of the band. We can try and tune those in, but we'll hear a loud uh, heterodyne tone because of the uh, beat frequency oscillator. We can receive the stations after fashion if we zero beat to the station, but the audio quality isn't very good. So there's one station there, but not very easy to pick it up. The HR1680 was quite a nice radio at the time and still performs quite well for basic ham radio use. In conjunction with the HX1681 transmitter, it could form part of a complete CW amateur radio station for under $400. It was dramatically better than the HR-10B, for example, and while not up to the specs of an HW or SB series, it was significantly less expensive. Heathkit published some service bulletins for the radio listing common problems. You can find this in a Google search. This article of modifications was published in the January 1980 issue of 73 magazine. One nice enhancement could be to add a third-party digital frequency display. This could be off-board or ideally on the front panel. Either an LCD, LED, or the Morse code type such as this would work. A red LED might match the color scheme of the rest of the front panel. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please check out my other videos on vintage radios and test equipment.